Good afternoon, uh, participants. Um, welcome to our webinar this afternoon, the Thursday, the 20th day of August uh, 2020. Uh, we will be having a session uh, delving on the interactive sector, uh, on the creative sector, and just trying to understand what happens within the sector and the opportunities that are available. Uh, with the national anthem as we normally do and uh, we shall recite the national anthem in English. O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation, justice be our shield and defender, may we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Okay, um, so today we are going to have uh, Mike Strano uh, talking to us. Uh, Mike is the founding director of uh, FAT uh, Music and Entertainment. Uh, we'll be discussing with him uh, some of the issues that are uh, within the creative sector. Uh, we will also have uh, on the discussion David Kate, who's an IP lawyer. We will also have uh, William Magan, who's an IP lawyer, uh, contributing uh, to the discussions. Uh, we will have uh, a commentary given by Mohammed. Uh, Said uh, briefly in just a little while, and. Uh, we are grateful to have on uh, Emily Okeo. Uh, Emily Okeo is uh, at today's uh, session uh, through the, at the American Konomoi Facebook page. So once again, welcome everybody. We are looking forward to uh, quite an. I'll give this opportunity to Mohammed uh, Said. Mohammed Said is a young mediator. Mohammed Said will be able to say hello and uh, give us a commentary as we just uh, uh, comments. Uh, welcome, Mohammed. Uh, our moderator for this, Mr. Mike Swano. Uh, the topic for today is a wonderful topic. It talks about talent deal, talent right, contract performances, commission, intermediaries, intellectual properties, and regulations, and whether mediation is an option. I think that's a very wonderful topic, and uh, as media, I would like to understand this aspect. Conflict resolution, uh, the regulators, and uh, talents. What I know is just briefly that uh, there is also some misunderstanding in terms of uh, regulating the collect, at, uh, in terms of um, collection of royalty and distribution from the, the Music Corporate Society of Kenya. Uh, those are some conflict between um, musicians and, uh, and the organization itself, whereby uh, the, the musician complained that they were, they were getting major amounts, uh, 2,500 as royalties. So there was that kind of uh, exchange of words in the internet. Uh, from that, I understood that 
in this aspect, there is some conflict. There is conflict and also there is a need for, for regulation and how to manage those conflicts. And maybe mediation can, can come up and solve those uh, conflicts amicably and uh, amend relationship between these different, uh, different boards and organizations. I understand that in Kenya, the different uh, maybe Mike Strano will explain more to this. Kenya Copyright Board, this Mutula clause of regulating the youngsters, uh, prov uh, providing uh, uh, music which are vague and all that kind. So there is some regulation in this aspect whereby we are, we are left out as mediators. So it's very important. I'd like to welcome Mike Strano to explain this in details so that we understand. Because if you understand this music aspect of and the intermediaries because you can't mediate without understanding what you're mediating. Thanks a lot. Back to Sarah. Back to Sarah, please. Okay. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Hello. Uh, for the commentary that uh, you have been able to give us. Uh, yes, Mohammed, uh, thank you very much. Uh, your commentary is the most appreciated. Um, I think we'll go straight on to our guest uh, for today, who is uh, Mike Strano. Mike, great to have you with us. Um, tell us, who is Mike Strano? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mohammed, for um, for the introduction as well. Um, Sarah, I just re I just realized I said I was going to do a slide, and I don't have it ready. So, as I as I open it, uh, if you could allow me to share screen, um, just to take people through as well um, a little bit of what we what we do, and then I can talk about myself in the in the interim. Um, but as we as we do that, uh, maybe we can just kind of outline uh, some of the aspects that uh, Mohammed mentioned as well that that uh, your your members are interested in. Uh, picked up um, uh, royalties and the regulation of them as as one. And I and I guess Sarah, at this uh, at this point, I'd just like to hear from from. Uh, the your organization a little bit more uh in terms of what do you mean by mediation where does mediation so i guess mine is a question back to you where does mediation where does it have a place between uh regulations and 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 law that would be interesting for me to understand as well um in order to, to have some context Um, okay, uh, uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, I, you have been made the co-host, so you will be able to share your slide and uh, probably just um, to, to answer what uh, mediation is. Uh, normally what happens, every time you have people together, either working together or living together, there will always be opportunities for conflict and dispute. Uh, so mediation is uh, a way in which a neutral, uh, that means someone who is not a party or someone who is not directly involved in the conflict or dispute, assists those who are in conflict or dispute uh, to be able to reach some kind of understanding concerning uh, I think what is important and what is quite unique about mediation is the fact that uh, the focus of, of the whole mediation process and the mediator is not necessarily to be able to arrive at a settlement or arrive at an agreement, but more to be able to enable the parties to understand each other 
in a much better way and therefore to be able to enhance or improve their working relationship or their living relationship going forward. So uh, a mediator just comes in and uh, helps those who are having some sort of difficulties. It could be really loud, uh, it could be subtle, so of difficulty and the mediator just helps them be able to find out you know what are our common interests what are how can we be able to address this as a party are what mediation is um so Mike, I would uh, just, you can go on and yeah. be able to proceed to share your screen. If you that's fine. Thank you, Sarah. That, that's clear. Now I get some, I, I mean, I generally understand what mediation is. Uh, what was important for me is to understand the context. So it's actually a lot, uh, a lot more involving than I first understood. So thank you. Are you able to see my screen? Absolutely. Thank you. And so I just want to give an overview for the audience because I'm, I'm involved in the creative industry generally uh, through, through different forms. So this will guide some of the questions uh, in, our, in our discussion. So the company is Fat Music and Entertainment. Uh, it was founded in, in 1999. Um, and Fat stands for Pomoja Hip Africa Um Started as a magazine for some of you who may remember. Um, magazine is, a, is an incredibly difficult uh, business, uh, challenging business. So we exited the magazine business in uh, 2000. Um, so we did two years. But when, when we went into a monthly uh, entertainment guide, which is Fat Buzz, which is now actually in its 19th year, um, we've not been printing for the last two years. We went digital. Um, but we're, we're in 19 years now with FAPAS. So FAPAS is our media uh, business unit. Uh, and the whole objective of FAPAS is to basically uh, uplift the music industry. We don't talk about uh, gossip or gara, or gara stories or conflicts or anything like that. <clears throat> All our stories are, are positive. They're about people who are doing things um, so that we, we hold them up as role models for for the youth and also uh, role models for um, for the the industry itself for creatives themselves so um, so from fat buzz uh, which we we started the magazine in 99 fat buzz we started in in 2000 um, in 2000 uh, we also provide content for safaricom get it four and one as well and their edutainment channels uh, from 2001, we've been doing event production, starting with our own concert in 2001. Um, and that was at Safari 7s back in the day. Uh, we had, it was one of the very first performances of Necessary Noise. Um, and uh, then uh, we've been doing that and we've expanded our scope from, from concerts to fashion shows to award ceremonies. We produced the All Africa Music Awards in, in Nigeria. Um, so from, from our uh, base in Nairobi, we work all over Africa um, and we basically manage supply and manage talent and then we, we script a show. Uh, so it, just think of it like live TV, but there's, there's, no, there's no one yelling cut, you know, and that's everything from product launches, uh, building, la we've launched buildings, planes, cars, um, award ceremonies, as I mentioned, team building, we even do conferences as well. Then in uh, 2004, we started our own event called uh, Kenya Music Week, which has since grown into Ongea. So Kenya Music Week ran for 10 years. Then we refreshed the brand to Ongea, the Eastern Africa Music Summit, which has run another five years, uh, the last event being in uh, February. Um, its, its objective is to bring the industry together under one roof and it's very interesting that, you know, Ongea was actually set up um, probably indirectly as a mediation forum. Um, I used to say, let's get together as an industry and sort out our problems uh, or our challenges rather. Um, so <clears throat> it, it, it seems, to, um, seems to align with 
uh, what uh, this your organization does. Um, the difference probably is that we never had a professional mediator in, involved. So that's, that's something quite interesting that we could look at um, moving forward. So, um, so Angea's objective is to create an industry that is more uh, professional, transparent, and profitable for all. Um, we stand for, for, for those uh, three pillars, which result in more sustainability and equity for the industry. So we're, it's a capacity building event. It's a not-for-profit event, um, and everyone looks forward to it. We're not sure how we're going to do the next edition under the, under the new normal. We're still thinking that through. Um, but I, I believe that there, there, there's still a need, and already this, uh, today's forum has got me thinking about um, maybe we should have a session around mediation specifically for our, our, our creative industry audience um, at the next Ongea. Um, we then, Ongea uh, brought to us various things, even though it was not for profit. And one of the things that got us into is intellectual property. We've been the agent for Eastern Africa for Shia music publishing from Southern Africa for the last seven and a half years. Um, so uh, what we do there is we represent the rights of uh, various clients. Some of those clients are South Soul, for example. Um, we have clients in Kenya, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Ethiopia um, that we, we onboard uh, for music publishing and uh, we manage the, the catalog for, for Shia publishing in the region of Eastern Africa, which is the 16 countries. Um, last but not least is our new business. Uh, this is within our group, but I'm not the only owner. I'm an equal owner with another uh, three other partners. Um, and it's a, it's a separate company, it's called My Movies Africa. So My Movies Africa is about um, retailing movies on rental, or ownership uh, legitimately, um, uh, proper original copies where the creators get their share of revenue from it. Um, we've started in Kenya. Um, we'll soon be opening up global. Uh, we have African content, but we'll soon be onboarding international content as well. So as you can see for the last uh, you know, 20 years, I've been involved in generally the music business, uh, the entertainment business generally. I'm also a partner in a, in a magic company uh, called Magic Africa, which is based out of Cape Town. We represent magicians across the continent. Um, so music, entertainment, uh, intellectual property, and now into movies as well, or digital content generally. Um, in 2016, we were ranked uh, number 36 in, in, in 100 of uh, small medium enterprises in Kenya. That's mainly driven by our event business. It's currently our biggest revenue driver. Um, I'm also an, on the accelerator program for entrepreneurs organi organization, which is a, a global organization um, as well. At, I'm a third year accelerator trying to, to scale uh, my business. Um, and then I was also a, um, uh, a founding director of uh, a founding board member of the Event Managers Association of Kenya um, with uh, the late Big Kev. I was on the, I served on the first board um, and uh, the, the organization uh, still runs. I think it's now on its uh, fourth uh, board. The boards are, are annual. Um, I no longer serve, but I'm still a member of the organization and, and very open to also answering questions about Event Managers Association of Kenya. Um, I'm Australian by birth. Um, I've worked in, in the region since 1998. Uh, I came to Kenya working for a multinational company in agribusiness. Um, I used to do uh, product development in uh, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Madagascar, and Ethiopia, and Sudan. So traveled around quite a bit in those days before I, I joined this company full time. I hope that's enough uh, background. Happy to answer any other questions. Um, moving forward, Sarah, I think we can now maybe get into some specific questions around the, the topic for today. Sarah, are you hearing me? Uh, 
Sorry, uh, I, have, I have a question. Sure. Uh, my question is concerning uh, here in Kenya, there is a board uh, which is chaired by uh, Mutula Kalonzo. Uh, um, uh, is this you, about, is this you uh, excuse me, uh, you didn't introduce yourself. Is that you, Mohammed? Okay, Mohammed. Mohammed. Mohammed yeah. Yeah. Please, can you have your camera on? Anyone asking okay. me a question, can we have the camera on? Each okay. time you ask. Yeah, go ahead, Mohammed. Okay, uh, my camera is on now. Right. Yes, thank you. Okay, nice. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. My question is sometimes like uh, the regulatory body, there is a conflict between the regulatory bodies and the young uh, musicians. Uh, the message that they give out to the public, maybe uh, in, uh, in the understanding of the regulatory body, they see it as a, a vague or uh, something that uh, may uh, somehow influence uh, the public in a bad way. So it's more like uh, they try to regulate and restrict this kind of music. So we see the conflict between the youngsters, or like here in Kenya, we have the ethic group, and sometimes the Mutula Kilonzo is in charge of one organization that regulates music in Kenya. And uh, we see this conflict that happening between young musicians and uh, the, 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 the government regulatory bodies. So how do we uh, deal with that? Thank you for your question. Just just a, a technical correction. It's, it's Dr. Ezekiel Matua, uh, who is the chief executive officer of the um, Kenya. So the organization is the Kenya Film Classification Board. I think it's also I think it's also important for for us for we as practitioners in our industry to to also uh, remember that. Uh, um, uh, regulators and boards are just that they are boards they are not uh, they are not individuals even though sometimes individuals have a lot of of prominence and uh, and perceived power um, but as you know uh, in your profession you know it, all of these individuals uh, so um, dr. Ezekiel Matua is employed uh, by the government of Kenya uh, and at the end of the day, uh, we as taxpayers are employing him. Um, and he is mandated by the board, which is a, a group of experts uh, drawn from different uh, creative industries. In fact, one of the board members is uh, Jun Gashui, who you, would, who you may know as a prominent intellectual property lawyer um, uh, in Kenya, and also an artist in her own right. Um, so the so the the board has certain regulations that they work within the law, and it is around uh, classification. Um, so whatever is being directed, whatever is being through the CEO, one would hope that the board is party to it, and uh, whatever is being directed as an action is within the law. Uh, I believe some of the cases that you have talked about. Um, the artists that you mentioned that there, there definitely was some concern, not just from the board, but also from the general public um, around the, the, the specific lyrics and the, their classification. The role of, I'm, I'm not a member of the KFCB, and there may be others here who, who are on this call, but my understanding of the KFCB is that their role is to classify content. Um, so. They're the ones who give it a classification of whether it's uh, for consumption, or whether it's general exhibition, uh, parental guidance, uh, age 16, or adults only. So in that context, if, you, if these music videos were a movie, for example, um, and if, if it was classified by the board as 18 and above audience, that means that wherever the music video or whatever the song is played, it should be guaranteed that it's, uh, it's outside um, the visibility and without the, outside the, the audibility of um, 18 and uh, of below 18, okay? That's according to the law if it has a classification on that. Um, unfortunately, in the digital space, it's very difficult to regulate uh, what they call in the broadcast industry watershed hours. If you watch TV, you'll notice that I think it's from nine o'clock or from 10 o'clock afterwards, 
Uh, most of your alcohol advertising happens from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. And, and those are what you call the watershed hours. Those are the hours where it is assumed that those below 18 are no longer consuming that content, uh, which is not seen, seen to be acceptable. So I think KFCB's argument is such content should not be seen by my, what we call uh, anyone under 18, is, I guess called a minor, should not be seen by minors. But unfortunately in the digital space, it's very difficult to regulate what minors do or do not see because there are no watershed hours. It's not controlled. Uh, at this point in time, technology can do anything. It can always always be controlled in the future. Um, but, uh, but it's not controlled by the broadcaster, in this case being YouTube, for example. Um, so, so, that's, so, so, so there's, I guess for me, my question back to this organization is, and, and, and you can help me with the answer, Mohammed, if the regulator has worked within the law and has exercised their powers within the law that a certain piece of content is, uh, you know, is not, should be banned, you know, uh, for example, and if they are working within the law, what my question to you as mediators is what is the role in that, in that context of a mediator where where I think number one, it would need to be established if in fact they were breaking the law. And if they weren't, uh, what is the role of the mediator in that context? How could a mediator like yourself, Mohammed, help uh, such a group in that scenario? Uh, thanks a lot for the, for the question. Uh, according to me, like, uh, like the way uh, our moderator Sarah has said that uh, mediators are supposed to facilitate uh, and uh, trying to bring a compromise, a compromise, uh, a compromise standing between the two positions. Sometimes, like uh, we see the youth, the ethnic groups uh, or youth, they have the is uh, languages maybe the conception well board have taken the right decision in doing so so they tell that they can talk and come up with their their solution their own solutions solve the crisis that they're in so that's uh, that's uh, the work of us mediator trying to solve uh, this issue we don't we don't impose decision we don't impose opinion but we try to facilitate giving each one uh, time to explain themselves and the reasons and uh, also give the opponents either party to see the perspective for another side so that they can come up with a more lenient and more understanding solution so according to my my view is uh, I will I'll try to bring them together by by letting them understand each other perspective, maybe by that they will be able to come up with understanding because uh, it is true there is a revolution in music. So, uh, so both the youngsters need to understand and also the, and also the board also needs to understand because the world is also ever changing. I think that's my answer is somehow enough. Okay, Thanks thank, a lot. You, thank, thank you very much. I mean, I do know to the to KFCB's credit, I do know that uh, meetings were held, face-to-face -face meetings uh, were held, um, which is good. I, I guess what, what may have helped uh, in, in, in that uh, situation is that if, if the group could have gone with the mediator um, as well, it may have it may, the result may have been different or may have been the same, but there may have been less, uh, uh, less, less uh, you know, there was, a lot of, there was a lot of bad press around it. So there could have been a more positive outcome. I, I, I agree, Mohammed. Cool. Sarah, are there any other questions? Um, I think we've dealt with the regulator around, regulations around Kenya Film Classification Board. I'm, I'm happy to, if anyone has a question around intellectual property specifically. Uh, yes. 
Um, yes, Mike, thank, thank you very much. Um, Hello? There seems to be some... Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for being able to take us through uh, what you are doing as uh, FAT and uh, Ongea, and actually already uh, Dell. Yes. Uh, already. Okay. Um, uh, Mike. Thank Thank you for taking us through uh, what uh, explaining uh, what you're covering. Uh, I, I just probably would like you to help us understand uh, uh, who exactly is, is in this uh, particular sector. Is it only the musicians? Is it only the, uh, the, the, the actors? Do we have teachers involved? Who else is in this particular to the creative economy. Uh, what kind of economy holds? What's the potential uh, within this uh, particular economy? Uh, maybe you could take us through that. That's fine, Sarah, thank you. Um, so um, we're actually currently uh, co-producing an event with, uh, for a Frexen Bank. Uh, Frexen Bank is a development bank um, that is interested uh, as African import uh, import export bank is interested in the creative industry. Um, so they have an event um, next September in Kigali, and we actually have some some virtual versions of that event uh, that started last month. Um, so we're co-producing uh, the creative uh, part of that event. That event is called the Intra Africa Trade Fair which is in Kigali 6 to 12, uh, next September, 2021. Um, I'll share more info in, uh, later on uh, with Sarah, you can share with your members. Um, so basically, uh, as, as that, I'm gonna use that as a reference just to, to show you how we have organized as this conference, a creative industry. Um, we have organized it into seven sectors. Um, there is uh, music, there is fashion, there is film, television, and animation. Um, there is uh, what we call, there's gaming and what we call XR. XR is um, uh, virtual reality, uh, mixed reality, and augmented reality. Uh, mixed reality is a combination of VR and AR. Um, there's visual arts. So those are sculptures, paintings, everything like that. There's performance, which covers the non-music side. So that is theater, comedy, um, magic, dance, acrobats. Uh, and then there's the, the, what we call the literary arts, which is now uh, you know, poetry, readings, literature itself, and things like that. So, um, so uh, there's a question, there's some questions coming in, sorry, it's a distraction. Um, so, so basically uh, there are seven sectors in, in the creative economy, according to myself and my company, and that's how we, how we organize it. They could be organized different ways. In Kenya, it, it hasn't yet been formally organized uh, into those sectors, but I do know there is a new culture policy being drafted that has drafted some organization of the, what they call the CCI, the Creative Cultural Industry. Um, and you'll find across Africa, CCI is used quite a bit. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a master plan by the African Union um, that on the CCI um, that is currently um, seeking to be ratified. Um, by, by member states. So, so that's, that's how we organize the industry. So as you can see, it's very broad. 
It's very diverse, but there's a lot of similarities. Uh, one of the, the biggest similarities is in intellectual property. It pretty much cuts across in terms of their various rights for, for various sectors. The other one obviously is creativity. It's a, it, there's art in every, every part of that as well. Um, potential, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have uh, numbers, but we're talking billions of shillings uh, for Kenya. Um, there was a figure by CS Amina uh, when they were doing the stimulus package saying that there's a study that um, the creative industry in Kenya already uh, contributes 6% to the GDP um, of Kenya. So, and if you look at other more developed nations uh, like the UK and the US, it's even higher where they have, you know, where they've organized themselves and where they're monetizing the intellectual property a lot more efficiently and, and transparently and effectively. Um, it is, you know, we, we estimate that at, at least in terms of direct employment, it must be at least 100,000 directly employed in terms of them being the artists themselves or them being the creative themselves. But now who those creatives then employ um, is, and, and you know, the industries below them and consultants and, and what have you um, is, is much more. You may be talking about a times five or a times 10 factor. Uh, the truth of the matter is we don't really know. Um, our industry until recently hasn't really been, um, for all the noise that is made about it, hasn't really been um, a, a focal point. You know, when uh, the president came up with the big four, uh, a group of us were arguing that it should be the big five and creative industry should be the fifth. Um, because if you look, if you look across Africa and if you look across the world, uh, well, for Africa generally, the next uh, industrial re revolution for Africa is creative industry. Um, and that is essentially mining the creativity and the ideas of Africa's people, um, which, which uh, can, be, can be monetized. Um, so it's, it's definitely an industry to be reckoned with. It's an industry that is very misunderstood. Um, it's an industry that I can't say is respected um, uh, to where we would want it to be respected. Um, you know, I, I, but I think things are changing. I, there, but there's a stigma to being an artist versus being a, a lawyer or a mediator or a farmer. Um, so it, there is a stigma around it. And, and that's something that as an industry that we're also looking, looking to change because it is a big opportunity. And I think once we start having more success stories, those, those stigmas will, will, will go away. But back to the topic of, of today, I think, you know, I, I think part of the reason why there's also a stigma is the inability of our industry to let me use the word argue, but maybe the, the word should be debate. Um, debate with, with demeanor um, and with maturity. Um, you know, bottom line, creative people, myself included, um, creative people, creative uh, are emotional people. You know, um, if they weren't emotional people, <clears throat> we wouldn't have the brilliant creativity that we see. And, and what comes out in their art is all that emotion. Um, the downside of being so creative and so emotion, emotional is that it doesn't help when you have a conflict. Um, so the temptation is to, to lose your, your cool and your grace immediately and it often becomes because a lot of, of our creative industry, because they are so creative and talented and recognized for it, they, they very quickly become public figures. So all of a sudden you're in the public eye and you disagree with something and the only way you know to react is through emotion. Um, of course, as we, as we grow older and wiser, we know how to manage that a bit better. 
Um, but it's something I must say does challenge our industry. And I, I would say that that would, that would build a strong case to say that our industry would definitely benefit from, from having mediators because, you know, as you've said in the introduction remarks that mediators are there to reason, mediators are there to consider uh, both sides, you know, and to outline both sides. And, and often we find in conflict is that you can even have two parties saying the same thing, but they're using different words and they feel it's a disagreement, but they don't realize it. it's not. Um, they're actually agreeing, but just from a different perspective. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think there's, a, there's a lot of scope definitely for the creative industry to, to work with mediators, to, to deal with the challenges they have, which, which are varied at, at, uh, at different levels of complexity and different levels of, of importance as well. Um, I see William had his uh, hand up. William, you have something to say? Please go on. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, it's actually very exciting, uh, really, truly exciting to hear from you. And uh, for me, I, when I look at you, I see uh, a success story that uh, you're looking for. You are a success story. And I'm very sure that uh, you would love to see more success stories. Uh, the question perhaps that I just want to ask, you know, where I sit as an intellectual property lawyer is from your observation and from your interactions with the uh, the various creatives. Uh, what is your estimate of their appreciation of intellectual property? Do they even know uh, that it's an asset just like any other asset? Uh, you know, it's interesting you have you have engaged with the uh, creatives from different countries, uh, from South Africa. South Africans, uh, you know, have understood what intellectual property assets are and how they can commercialize and, uh, and, 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 and not just earn a living from it, but really live decently. So from your observation, would you say that Kenyan creatives have actually appreciated or even know uh, the gold mine that they sit on. Thanks. Um, I would say yes and no. Thank you for the question, William, and it's a, it's a very relevant one. I would say yes and no. Uh, why would I say yes? Yes, I think there's a general awareness at different levels that creativity is an asset. Um, the no part is many struggle to understand how to, to monetize that asset outside of a performance fee. Um, performance is the obvious one. You know, we, 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 we get on stage, we perform for this amount of time, be it any art form or or a product, you know, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I, I sell my painting, you know. Um, um, now, whether, whether I've just charged for my time and my labor, or whether I've also charged for my creativity is, is, are two different things. And that's where the creative industry is blessed. It's blessed twofold. You, in the creative industry, if, it, if, you, if you work it out, correctly and if the industry and the, and the country you work within is enabled you can benefit twice from it um, which I don't know if it is there well intellectual property is there in other industries as well um, but definitely in the creative industry uh, it, it, it's a foundation um, so yes you can be paid for your time uh, and secondly you can also be paid for your ideas and your creativity and, and, and uh, one is active income, the other one is passive income. Um, so 
um, that is a that is a great opportunity. So I think most creatives get it. The question is now execution and implementation um, in an industry and in a continent that doesn't value intellectual property as much as it should. Um, so can I ask anyone in this group, when was the first time, if you can remember back to your education, when was the first time, at what age were you or what class were you when you heard about intellectual property rights and creativity or, I, or intellectual property generally? Can anyone remember back? When was the first time? I should say when I was in college myself. Exactly. And you can bet in the more developed nations, it starts from primary school. Okay. That's why for, for, for me who grew up in Australia, I, I, I know not to pirate music. It, it, I'm conditioned that way. I was raised that way. Um, but for the average, I don't want to pick on Kenyans, for the average, for the average African, that, that wasn't there. You, it, IP is, is put out there as a specialist and it's, it's actually over complicated and it's not really complicated. Yet I can tell you that when you're in primary school, you learned about farming. Yeah? You learned about how to grow crops and, and, and the basics, you know. You learned about the value of land. You learned about the value of livestock, um, the value of farming. So that's where we need to get to in Africa generally with the creative industry, that it is seen and valued as another industrial revolution. And, and, and the basics and the rights and wrongs are taught from a very early age. Um, because that's the only way, you know, we can, we can all train ourselves, you know, as, as creative practitioners one by one, and it will be a, a very expensive exercise to do so. Um, but even then, if you don't go into an enabling environment, an enabling support, Um, Mike, your microphone went off. Uh, please switch it on. Sorry. Thank you. So, to answer your question, William, it, it, it becomes, um, it, yes, the value is there, but when, you, when, when you're not valued yourself as a creative, do you, see the, do you see the same value or do you see your full potential when, when someone's also not validating you, you fully? The second answer to, my, to that question is also the systems, coming back to Kenya, but also in Africa, outside of South Africa, the systems for the monetization of intellectual property are broken. Um, and they have been broken for a very long time. Our laws in Kenya are actually some of the best laws on the continent to protect copyright. It's just that they're not fully enforced. Um, and, and there's been a lot of corruption over the years as well. There's been a lot of mismanagement. There's been a lot of incompetence. You know, you name it, our industry has seen it. Um, so I think the challenge for creatives is also one of apathy. Um, why should I worry about my royalties when they're just being stolen? And when I do all this work and I, I played all over Kenya and what have you, and I'm getting 2,500 in royalties at the end of the year and no explanation as to why. Now, this was the pre-COVID attitude. Um, we are now five months into COVID. Those artists who, who didn't really care so much about their royalties before, are now really caring because they have not performed in five months. And that is the only way they were making their money um, because the intellectual property system is broken. So um, there's a lot of piracy. So they're not making money from digital, their digital content. And they're not making money from the royalties because the money has been lost in the value chain. So yes, they value the intellectual property, but and it's becoming a, a higher value uh, at the moment in the current context. And I hope during this 
uh, COVID moment, um, we can actually use it to our advantage to, to have some corrections in place because you'll find people like myself um, um, and, and I, I, I see I'm in, in the company of Liz Lenjo as well. I know David Kate has joined the call. We all represent different clients in the creative industry and we've been lobbying for years for them to be paid what they're worth in terms of intellectual property. Um, and I'm hoping during the current context, and, and, and we lobby, and sometimes we lobby as business people and as professionals, sometimes we lobby alone, even without the support of the creatives themselves, um, because they don't either understand it or they don't want to get involved in the perceived politics or they're just happy at performing. But we've seen a shift in the last few months that because they're now not performing, they're actually now caring a lot more about those royalties they should have been earning all those years. You know, there's, there's 1 billion shillings unaccounted for with one particular CMO that's currently having a forensic audit being done on it. Finally, we've been calling for a forensic audit for years and finally it's happening. Uh, so collections from 2015 to date have been a billion shillings that have not been distributed to the, the songwriters, have not been distributed to the composers or the publishers. So, Yes, they understand the value, but some of them have lost hope along the way, but I believe the value is being reestablished. So um, it's definitely uh, a moment of, of change in the current context. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, you've mentioned the performance fees and you've mentioned the royalties. Um, would you probably just explain to us what are the different uh, earning revenues, uh, earning uh, pathways for the creatives and uh, what really should they be thinking about, uh, you know, when looking at what, what they need to uh, be going for? Uh, essentially explain what applies where, what kind of earning does a creative uh, have or get in a particular area and what do they need to think about for example when uh, they are signing up uh, different things is, is that clear yeah absolutely so I, I mentioned earlier that there's I think the easiest way to break down the streams of income is a is an active stream and a passive stream okay mm -hmm. so let's mm -hmm. talk about active stream uh, for for now so an active stream could be, I'm a visual artist and I have a painting and I'm gonna sell the painting at, at X through a distributor or through a gallery or in a, in a market or even direct. Um, I am a performer, be it a musician, a comedian, a dancer, and I'm gonna be contracted for a particular performance. Um, or I may even do a, put on a stage show and record it and, and sell uh, episodes of that on TV or on, in the digital space, you know. So those are al those are levels of uh, active income, basically work for hire. You know, I put in this work and I'm paid this for my time, which all of us here on this call do. You know, we understand that I have a particular skill and I have a particular experience, experience and you're taking this much of my time. So this is how I'm going to, to charge you. Obviously, it will be based, obviously, you, you have in business, you have a ways of, of setting up your rate card based on what is the actual cost versus what is the market rate. And you find somewhere in between. You know, your actual cost is what I call your walk away fee. Um, if you're not going to have your cost cover, then you're, you're not going to do it. And that's for every individual to establish what they are, what they are worth. And there's different ways to model that. Um, your market rate is, is the difference between um, that, that some of us on this call and, and some of us in the creative industry is that the market rate can be seasonal. Um, we, have our, we have our high season, uh, which is around December, uh, the festive period, any, any long weekends and, and things like that, or school breaks and what have you. And then we have our low season, which is usually January. Um, you know. Um, so, so supply and demand is also uh, a big impact on, on that active income, which is a little bit different to other, other professions. However, you have to remember creatives are entre entrepreneurs, you know, um, all of them. They, they, 
the employment is informal, they employ themselves. So they, they, whether they have a business registered or not, they, they are still having to uh, run themselves as a business and they have to prepare themselves in the high seasons for the low season. You know? And we're going through that the moment, the longest low season that the industry has ever faced. Um, so that is active income. Passive income is for me is, is money when you sleep. So passive income, uh, you know, for others, for, for some of us here could be, I've invested in land and it's appreciating over time. For a creative, a passive income is my royalties every time my song is played on radio, every time my comedy show is paid on TV, I, uh, I get uh, a royalty uh, from the broadcaster through the collective management organization and ultimately into my account, you know, um, maybe three times a year as a royalty payout. Passive income could also be, I have digital content online, I have it on YouTube, which is earning a share of YouTube's advertising revenue. I have it on Boomplay, I have it on Modundo. Um, I, I, I sell, uh, what's another one locally, MOOC. I have a movie on My Movies Africa. I'm on Showmax, I'm on Netflix, you know. So this is other ways of, of revenue from different revenue models that someone could, could earn. Um, what should creatives look out for? Uh, first and foremost, the agreements. Um, and to make sure that, that number one, you engage a lawyer for your agreement. Um, and so you understand it. Um, I think sometimes, again, because the creative industry is also a struggle. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, and it's a struggle, not just in Kenya, anywhere in the world, to, to make it, there's no such thing in life or in business and particularly in creative industry as an overnight success. I believe, I think I knew South Soul before many in Kenya knew South Soul. you know, people suddenly thought, oh, wow, these guys have come, been famous very quickly, but they didn't, people don't understand how, when that journey started. Um, you know, it's a very, very long journey. Uh, someone like Nameless now has been 21 years in the industry as well you know so it's it's not an easy path and it is a it's a, it's a hustle um every every day so because of that um when you finally as a creative start to get some traction the temptation is there just to blindly go for every opportunity um and it takes a lot of self-discipline it takes a lot of knowledge it takes a lot of experience and maturity to make the right decisions. Um, so I guess the advice for creatives is to get the right team around you, even if it's just mentors and advisors for now. Uh, if you can't afford to, to, to employ a team, at least have that mentor, at least have that advisor, could be a family member, could be a friend, could be someone in the creative industry. And then as you grow and you can afford services, definitely engage a lawyer to look at those agreements. I have, personally, I have signed a, a, a bad agreement. And when I realized that I had, I felt so stupid. But it was, it was the same situation. It was seven and a half years ago. It was a great opportunity. Um, that client has since terminated our agreement on very unfavorable terms. So the first thing I did, apart from being angry, I went back to my agreement and then I got angry at myself because they gave me such a bad agreement, which they shouldn't have. It was also unethical on their behalf. However, in law, they are, they are legally covered. Um, also in their agreement, I signed a disclaimer that said I had consulted a lawyer. Did I? No, not at the time. Um, because it was such a great opportunity I rushed, they were very enthusiastic. It was a personal relationship, but over seven and a half years, things have changed. You know, the company has changed ownership and the new owners um, don't see why they need an agreement with our company anymore. It's not personal, it's business, but that can happen to anyone, even you guys, you know? So it's very important to have a professional look at that agreement and to highlight the blind spots and to highlight the risks as well. Um, and even when we're now, we're, we're currently licensing content for My Movies Africa. 
we our, our agreement is 17 pages long you know it took us a long time to write it but we needed to make sure that we are covered so you can bet that we are covering our business yeah but in some in some cases we're also making sure in most cases we're also making sure the agreement is is uh, is very fair and very equitable and very easy to understand as as well but it's upon you the content creator to get your own legal opinion um, from all the agreements that we send out it's less than 10 percent that that a lawyer will come back to us you know so luckily we're very ethical our agreement i believe is fair but you know and the lawyers who do come back to us is just for some clarity in most cases they actually they actually consult us and say you know what you could phrase this this clause a, a, a better way it takes up less characters and stuff like that so we're actually learning from the lawyers that come back uh, to us um, but it's very important to get that legal advice um, and when deals go bad um, i'm learning here today it could be very interesting to to get, get a mediator in, in, involved and i currently have a bad deal so i may be reaching out to to one of you to help me uh, uh, sort it out as well. Yeah. Um, um, uh, thank you. So you've mentioned uh, some of the people. I think you've talked about mentors. You've talked about advisors. They are lawyers. So there's a whole group of of, of people involved in the sector. Maybe you could just uh, name some of the other people that are engaged within the creative sector and what their different roles uh, are and just uh, again uh, to do with that is it actually the creatives who are driving the sector or is it these other intermediaries who are actually driving the sector it depends on how you define driving um yes i mean i de i define I, I i define myself as an applied creative um interestingly i studied uh, applied science so i'm not a scientist but i'm an applied scientist um and I define myself as an applied creative as, because I don't feel I have unique ideas uh, in, my, in my thought process. Um, so, you know, composing a song, for example, would be very difficult for me. However, contributing to someone's song uh, would be easier because I've started the process. Um, so I find myself contributing and adding value to a lot of creative ideas. So I still say I'm a creative, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an applied creative. Um, so I believe there are many of us uh, applied creatives in the industry, and we're often called business people. Um, um, sometimes that term is positive, sometimes that, that term is negative, uh, depending on what sort of creative you are. Um, but none of us would be here in the, the creative industry is a complete value chain like any other value chain. Um, none of us would be here without the, the primary ingredient, and that's the creativity. Um, just the same way a baker wouldn't be there without the wheat farmer. Um, that's, that's where it starts at the end of the day. Um, so yes, the, the creatives are driving the creative industry. Without creativity, there would be no creative industry. However, uh, what I could say in terms of so they're, they're, providing, um, they're providing the ingredient, um, but I believe the rest of the, the stakeholders in the value chain are helping um, bake the cake, if you can look at that analogy as well. You know, so we have, we have different levels of processing, we have different levels of, of protection, we have different levels of production. We have different levels of, of monetizing, uh, of, of distributing, marketing. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, what's the saying? It takes a village, yeah? So it's, it, and it's very much so. You find that the creatives generally around the world who are the most successful, it has nothing to do with or little to do with how creative you are and more to do with how smart you were to build the right team around you and to make the right decisions. There are many talented creatives who haven't made it because they've not been able to let go or they've not invested in the team um, or they've not trusted people as well. You can't do everything. 
Uh, even myself, I do too much. That I know, and it's something I'm, I'm working on at the moment. But you, you, you need to engage your team, you need to engage your industry, you need to engage your government, um, because the rest of us are your enablers at the, end of the day, at the end of the day. A mediator is an enabler, is a service provider to the creative industry, so is a lawyer. Yeah, and so is someone like me who, who's investing and, and marketing and managing. Um, so in terms of the value chain, um, it's all there. I can say in Africa, it's very underdeveloped outside South Africa. And again, and the reason why is it, it's a vicious circle. You know, the, the money isn't getting to the creators. When the creators start getting the money um, from the CMOs, from the pirates, um, from the, the corporates who, who use our creativity too much and want to pay too little, um, until there is more equity in the industry, it's very difficult to, to build the, the structures. I know a lot of lawyers, and I'm sure there are some here, um, that have done so much pro bono work for the creative industry, or have done paid work, but then the creative doesn't pay them. You know, so it happens in any industry as, as, as well. So, and that's a responsibility a creative has as well. You know, you, you, shouldn't, you should be part of the solution, not part of the problem and you and start perpetuating the problem. So, uh, or the challenges, I like to say it. So, the, so we have an underdeveloped uh, infrastructure, um, mm -hmm. mainly because again, going back to education, when do we first, when, when do Africans first learn about IP and then, then roll that out in terms of, you know, when do you, when you start thinking about, I want to be an IP lawyer. Uh, fortunately, there are now more, um, but IP lawyers are just one role. You know, there are publishers like myself, I'm a publisher and I'm, I'm not legally trained, but I understand music publishing and, and I may know it more practically than even an IP lawyer would, but the IP lawyer would then help me with the legal aspects and when they're, challenges and, and things like that. So I know the business side, they know the legal side. There are publicists in charge of, of marketing and promotion. Um, there are distributors in charge of distributing digital content. There are everything from uh, image consultants to, to business uh, coaches. Um, we produce Safaricom uh, Toweza Live and, and Nikona Safaricom Live. In uh, Nikonos Farcom Live was in 2012, and that was a turning point for South to Soul. Um, I, I'm proud to say uh, we were part of that project, and they're also a client from a publishing perspective. In that in that program, every artist who went through that program got a business coach, got an image coach, and got a vocal coach, and got a performance coach. So we had some of Kenya's top coaches spending time with them. Now, what every artist got out of that um, opportunity is completely on them. You know, Sati saw, saw the opportunity and they grabbed it and they made the most of it and in every aspect uh, to, to master their craft and to, to improve their, their offering uh, to, to the market. But these are all the different levels in the industry that are required for a successful industry. And if you go to South Africa, you'll find the South African industry is very organized in that regard. There, there are music, there are recording labels there who will then go and employ A&R people, who will then go and subcontract image consultants and business coaches and, and, and the like. Um, but it's definitely, and this is the opportunity that exists for Kenya when we start, when Kenya starts looking at the creative industry more uh, seriously. It's not just the creatives that you see, it's everyone behind them, you know, if you, if, if any of you here, and I keep, I keep referring to South Soul because they're our best example at the moment and they have their launch coming up on, on the weekend. If you were to see the number of people behind the scenes, and they're now signed to Universal Music Group. So they have, they have UMG behind them. They have their own management uh, company behind them. They have a whole, um, they have their own legal counsel locally. They have people they employ you know, the people on their payroll just to get this project out of Midnight Train is there must be at least 50 people um, on a full-time or part-time 
scenario between the different companies plugging into that project and probably just as many casuals. And that's just one project. So if you replicate a hundred people behind one artist or one, one of your A-list uh, music, musicians, comedians, actors, films, you know, every film production has at least a cast and crew of, of 100 to 200. When we took Nikon or Safaricom or the Safaricom Toys Alive on the road, cast and crew alone, this was in 2018, uh, we know because we were doing transport and accommodation, that, that was 100 people um, already. And, and every show had four weeks rehearsal. Um, so it's a, it's a very big driver to the economy and, you know, and, and the sort of revenue uh, that trickle down to the support industries as well. You know, so there's many people in the chain and um, it, more people will benefit when this industry gets a lot more structure and is able to, to monetize uh, more efficiently. Uh, that's, a, that's the greatest challenge at the moment. It's uh, money is a tool, and there's not much you can do without it, unfortunately. Um, yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned um, enablers, uh, being able to provide the necessary support uh, for the creatives. And uh, earlier you mentioned that uh, Kenya has uh, some of the very best uh, uh, policy surrounding um, promoting the sector. Maybe you could highlight some of these which you think are quite exceptional. And uh, if there are any other policy concerns that uh, you may have, you can also be able to uh, just let us know some of these. Cool. All right. I'm, I'm, I'll answer this, but I saw Liz's hand up earlier. I, mm -hmm. I hope I haven't talked too long. I'll, um, I'll throw to her after this. Um, okay. Liz and I have worked together on some projects, so it would be good to hear her input as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in terms of, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not the lawyer here and the lawyers will, will validate this, but in terms of, I'm, I'm heavily networked across the continent. Um, so, you know, where I'm speaking from is in talking to other creative industries that I know, um, and that's across the entire continent. The copyright, the new Copyright Amendment Act 2019 that was assented by His Excellency on the 2nd of October, and we are very grateful to His Excellency. That, that said, him just assenting uh, that act um, the way it was, because it does have some weaknesses, um, but the, the way it was and realizing that we, needed, we had a sense of urgency was a big game changer for the industry, and it, it sent the right message to the industry, to the creative industry that, um, that this government is very interested in the, in the creative industry. Um, so, so we're very grateful to him. We're very grateful to parliament. And there was a, there's a Senate committee and, and some of us appeared before those various committees and made our submissions. And very grateful, of course, to the industry. There are many people and to, to, the, to the Kenya Copyright Board as a board and to its executive director. And there are many people, including some on this, this call that contributed to that that act and it's been a journey. Um, that act is a game changer in terms of copyright uh, for Kenya and in terms of an example across the rest of Africa. Nigeria, who has a bigger industry in film and a bigger industry in music than Kenya, the last time its copyright act was reviewed was in 1999. So we are talking, you know, we are talking 30 years ago. Um, so we're very grateful and I know at the moment that the Nigeria is looking to Kenya. They're currently reviewing it. They have a bill that's currently under review and they're actually looking to Kenya to, to, to borrow some of the best practice. I know South Africa has just sent their bill back to parliament because um, uh, it was, there were certain vested interests by various multi, multinationals that, that had corrupted the bill, you know. Um, so um, my colleagues in South Africa actually protested against it and it's now, it took the president to send it back to, to that. So if you look at the three biggest entertainment industries, uh, PwC does a report every year, without a doubt, uh, number one, number one and number two together pretty much are Nigeria and South Africa followed by Kenya. So we're in the top three creative industries in Africa. Um, 
And however, we have the best copyright act. Um, and I, I, um, if anyone would like to challenge that, I'm open to that. But we, we do have the best copyright act. And one of the biggest game changing elements in that copyright act is curtailing piracy. Um, if any of you have traveled, you may have traveled to some countries where you can't access certain websites um, just because of maybe culture or, or things like that or, or censorship by government or what have you. So through that technology, uh, we know that it's very easy for an internet service provider, and in Kenya we have a few of them, to block a customer's access to a website that they shouldn't be visiting. Okay. So in using that very simple technique, we are now able to, and it is in law, uh, we are now able to working with the internet service providers and it's something that a group that I'm on called Partners Against Piracy is working on with uh, TESPOC, which is the Association uh, for Technical Service Providers of Kenya. Um, we're working with them to, to basically now operationalize that act. So it just now means that your internet service providers will block you as a customer from accessing content online that is not legal content. So you can no longer go to Pirate Bay, you can no longer go to a torrent and get that local or international piece of content, be it a movie or a TV series or, or a piece of music at the end of the day for free. Because what your average consumer doesn't realize is that one, you're taking away money from the creative. And if the creative doesn't have money, uh, internationally or locally, if an international create, if an international studio who we represent through My Movies Africa, if they can't, if they can't make money in Kenya, how will they come and shoot a movie in Kenya? You know, so this is a, this is the thing when I went back to about our education system when people learn about the value of IP, if we're not, if the average consumer on the street is not respecting IP, then the industry won't, won't grow. But fortunately with this new act, we're able to, to force them to respect because they will no longer have access to it, which means they only have to, the only option they have is to purchase, a, purchase or hire or subscribe a legitimate copy. The minute that that gets done, then you have money pouring immediately into the industry. So there are some estimates that we've done as Partners Against Piracy, um, uh, um, and Modundo left, uh, led this piece of research. Um, we think in music alone, we're, we're losing uh, $10 million a year um, in, in music alone. Um, sorry, hang on. Yeah, ten million dollars a year. So we're talking, but that's a billion shillings uh, each year. Actually, it's more than that. It's ten to a hundred million dollars a year. So, so that's one to ten billion shillings a year that we're losing in revenue from pirated content. Um, so, just imagine what we could do with that sort of revenue in the industry. You know, creatives would be able to hire mediators. They would be able to hire you know, lawyers will be able to hire more managers and distributors. So, so that, is, that is the potential. And, and fortunately, that is what the new Copyright Act will do uh, for Kenya, uh, the minute we get it operationalized. So we're, we're losing at about $270,000 a day uh, for, every, for every day that that act is in operation. So that's what we're trying to turn around. That will directly help the music industry, animators, TV, um, books as well. Uh, books are being pirated online. Uh, anything that's being pirated, it can, games, it can turn it around instantly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I'll be inviting uh, Liz and uh, William to be able to comment just in a little while. Uh, but just before that, uh, uh, Mike, what are some of the disputes that uh, you have seen uh, in the sector? I realize you mentioned that uh, uh, corporates use creatives and pay very little. Yeah. Uh, so maybe just talk to us about some of, some of the things that you have seen as you know, areas of concern within the sector. Yeah, I think, so let me answer the one on corporates. So in two ways, uh, there, there are two, two levels of the extreme. 
One is um, infringement, okay, which means I have used your right without consultation and well, without an agreement, which is a legal extreme. And I know uh, David Cate uh, has handled some of those cases. Obviously, we can't mention names, but, but they're there. And it's, it's a complete, you can't say as a corporate who has links to multinationals or is a multinational, you don't understand intellectual property. In fact, your brand or your trademark is intellectual property. But sometimes there's a, there, there is a, there is feigned misunderstanding. Oh, we didn't know, you know, and they try and push the boundaries and get away with it. But fortunately, um, our industry, I believe, has gained more confidence. Our industry has more professionals like, like David and Liz and William who are, who are trained and, and willing to, to take on uh, these cases because they are straight infringement. On the other hand, there's bullying. Um, and it is, it is the, it is the, we're in Kenya, we have the corporate setting the price, not the creative setting the price. In Nigeria, you very much have the creative setting the price. If you're not gonna pay Wizkid this, he's not coming. Uh, forget Wizkid, now it's all about Burner Boy. If you're not gonna pay Burner Boy this, I'm sorry, no, okay? But in Kenya, I, I think there's a, the corporate, Corporate CEOs are more celebrities than our creatives themselves, okay? Because in Kenya, I feel, and I'm sorry, I may be bashed for this, but in Kenya, the average Kenyan respects money more than talent. That's why MPs uh, are celebrities equally, if not more, than an artist because money talks more than talent and it's very sad um however that may not be the case for all kenyans uh, definitely the case for nairobi i know when i take artists to perform up country they have so much love from from the real consumers up there so it really depends where you are but we know where the business is, is done so so because of so because of that because of the respect that our creative industry gets or the, or the lack thereof, um, you find a situation where our industry and our, our creatives are bullied and you find also that there's a lot of leverage of personal relationships. Um, you know, if, 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 if you work at a corporate and you wanna book me for a show, two things happen. Uh, one, I'm going to get you this show and uh, I'm going to take a cut. Uh, not, I'm going to get you this show because you're my friend. And, you know, so there's, there's corruption. And I'm sorry, taking a cut, unless you're the manager, is corruption. And the manager is in not just getting the deal, not just opening the door, doing, doing what a manager does in terms of what our organization, what, what my team does. That's real work of which we need to get paid for. Um, but just because I, I introduced you to someone and you want a cut, that's, I'm sorry, that's corruption. That, there's no other way, okay? Um, so that either happens or I'm more loyal to my company than I am to you. So I use my relationship to get you down to the last price where you feel like you've been bullied and because you're, you're my pal, I can't tell you. Um, so that happens in performances. That also happens in our business of, so we manage performances. Our company manages performances. We also manage the use of intellectual property. We call it synchronization. So it's the use of, of music and advertising, film, television, gaming. So that also happens a lot. Uh, so synchronization rates in Kenya are about a third of what they should be. And there's no other way to describe it than bullying. It's as simple as that. Because the companies who are bullying for these rates are the same people declaring double digit profits every year. I have nothing against capitalism. I have nothing against profits. 
but some of the profits these multinationals make in Kenya, they would never be allowed to make in Europe, okay? When you're consistently declaring 20, 25% you know, profits and your, and your mother company is declaring 10% profit in Europe, there's something wrong with the equity in our society in Kenya. The average creative per month does not make what the average employee of these corporates makes. And for me, that's fundamentally wrong, you know, because what these corporates can't run without our creativity as an industry. So we need to, we need to bridge, bridge the gap. I know that's very hard for some people to hear, um, but I think, you know, we need to, we need to get that message out there as, a, as an industry that we, we, are, we have value, so we should be valued. Um, and I, I feel getting back to the topic of today, I feel there's a place for mediators um, to work with our industry to, to help negotiate some of these, these deals as well. You know, yes, there's a place for a, a lawyer as well, but unfortunately sometimes when, when the end user sees a lawyer at the table, uh, all of a sudden it becomes a more perceived difficult conversation uh, versus, versus a business manager, you know? So there could be, because I, I, I know uh, being a professional mediator, um, you know, I know there are part-time roles for this, there are full-time roles for this. Uh, for those that are interested in the creative industry, you know, maybe, maybe being a mediator for a group of creatives could work, or maybe also if you have other skills or if you're, you're doing mediation on a part-time, maybe you can bring your business management skills to the industry. And, and then the client that you have, which may be a big artist, has the best of, you know, has, has a trained negotiator at the end of the day, um, who is driven by a business agenda for their client, but also wants to see the end user gain from this and can help the end user see um, what we're trying to sell them and, and to see the value, not the cost. That's the challenge at the moment. Someone looks at the cost and doesn't understand the value. Okay. Uh, could you just, uh, I realize you've talked about, you know, the issue of money and, uh, and payment. Uh, are there other uh, instances where conflict or dispute occurs? Could you give us some examples of uh, some of those uh, areas where dispute occurs within the sector? Um, yes, I think uh, money, um, just to finish on money is that, you know, have I been paid? Have I been paid my worth? I wasn't paid for a job, you know, things like that. And there's a lot of those. Um, and also, you know, the event, the event industry is very much a part of the creative industry as well. And there are sometimes disputes in there where a creative hasn't been paid uh, for their services, but it also works the other side where the creative has, hasn't uh, delivered on their side of the agreement. You know, maybe they didn't turn up for sound check, maybe they gave a poor, poor performance, uh, things like that, you know, maybe they double booked, it happens, you know, mistakes happen on, on both sides. Um, but in terms of other um, areas where there's dispute, there's often dispute around intellectual property. Um, there's often a dispute around infringement. And this, this now becomes a time where I want to, uh, if I could bring in Liz to help me uh, answer, answer this one. Um, I just want to understand that, you know, if there's an intellectual property infringement uh, list, um, is there scope under the current law to involve mediation first, or is the right is the right journey to have legal first, which is usually um, Sarah, we would have something for an infringement, we would have a cease and desist letter that would highlight the infringement and ensure that the infringement was stopped. 
um, then followed by, by or maybe including a demand letter for any damages or revenue and things like that. Um, my understanding of the law at the moment is that it's law first, followed by, you know, if it does go to, to I mentioned, um, in most cases now the courts will refer it for mediation first. Um, Liz, is my understanding correct? Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Liz Lenjo, uh, an advocate of the High Court, and I practice under the name of my IP legal studio. Uh, and my firm predominantly um, specializes in intellectual property, entertainment, media, and fashion law. So we basically work with creatives. Um, I have had the opportunity to either be a mediator or a negotiator uh, for my clients. Um, so in the past, say, eight years, I've been able to mediate about 10 to 12 disputes in the creative industry. Uh, some of them have been sealed under confidentiality. Uh, that's why I think some people don't talk much about them. Um, but we've managed, uh, you know, to be able to do that. So in relation to your question, Mike, when it comes to mediation and arbitration, um, we need, the parties need to submit to mediation and arbitration in their contracts where you have a clause on dispute resolution that will say should there be an, um, um, a dispute that the parties shall proceed to either mediation first and then arbitration. And then you have the option of choosing uh, the, the, let me say platforms for lack of a better term, in terms of where to go for this mediation or arbitration. Uh, being a WIPO scholar, um, my, my clients tend to generally use the mediation and arbitration clause from WIPO. Um, but sometimes, actually most times we've never really escalated to that level because somehow I have managed to bring them down uh, in terms of their temperament and figure out uh, how they can just reason among themselves and, and save money because also the WIPO arbitration center is not as cheap, right? I mean, at right. the end of the day, they will still uh, split the fees 50-50 to compensate the mediator or arbitrator. But you yeah. see, at the end of the day, for a creative, $1,000 is still a lot of money. So if the mediator sure. costs $2,000, still a lot yeah. of money. So um, yeah. what I do is I always make my clients aware of this. And I say, you know what, right now, you have the opportunity in mediation to control what happens, the outcome, uh, because then that way you're able to figure out uh, a, a clear strategy, you know, make sure it's a win-win, lose-lose kind of situation for all parties so that no one is having the upper hand. Uh, and I tell them, you know what, if you go to court, chances are you will, you will not, definitely will not be able to control uh, the outcome. In some cases, arbitration, although arbitration, you, you have the opportunity to sort of, um, you know, ask the arbitrator, please give us some time. We have, we, I think we, we, we can mediate this situation, but you will still compensate the arbitrator for the time that they have, you know, spent on, on, on your case until the time you decided maybe to settle out of, out of the arbitrator's uh, room. Um, yeah, so generally it's, it's about the parties. So of course, sometimes in the absence of, of that submission in the agreement, is uh you know we still get to have a conversation with them and say this is your best case scenario this is your worst case scenario uh if if you know the ip at hand really means that to you or the transaction at hand really means that much to you then again then i think you have to you know be aware of the following opportunities and, and, and options so the ones i've dealt with they have managed to see that you know at the end of the, at the end of the day with mediation Things, things tend to be much easier. And Mike, I know you can attest to how sometimes uh, creatives can get very um, temperamental and they hold a lot of grudges sometimes with each other. Um, yeah. So we've managed to even salvage some of these relationships and see them work yeah. together after, after their disputes. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the thing. I think, um, you know, it, it's great to learn about... Um, let me get the, the name right before I <laughs> misstate. There were Siliana Hub mediators. Uh, it's great to learn about you guys. Um, uh, I think I have been a lone ranger. Not, not really, but because we are a few of us who've managed to do some of these uh, uh, mediations in the creative industry. There's myself, there's June Gashui, who I know of, um, Jerry Gitonga, and now from what I've heard, David Kate as well, uh, who I've recently interacted with. But uh you know but we, we we tend to be we're not so many so and then it's because also the, there isn't much infrastructure so like for us as you've had we, we generally rely on on, on wipo 
um, to sort of assist where we have things gone wrong. Um, I think for sure there's more that can be uh, said. I think I think I think there's more sensitization that needs to happen for for the IP uh, conversation around mediation. But it's also because, like Mike said, uh, and, and, and when William asked about how well do the creatives understand intellectual property, uh, I think I would also make an addition in my assessment, having been in the industry for the last 10 years. I came to the realization that we have the new generation uh, creatives and the old, generative, the old generation crea creatives. So the old generation are very aware of the intellectual property rights. Uh, and it's, I think because uh, at the time, either the infringement was happening, they were young, um, so they've managed to embrace it. So the likes of Kina Nameless, uh, you know, because them amongst their peers are Kina Angela Ndambuki of Tatu, who is also uh, an advocate of the High Court, and there's June also, who's an, an artist as well. So because of that, I think they have been able to understand that um, that ecosystem. Now with the new generation artists is where I have realized. And I think after speaking at the last Ongea summit is when I realized, oh my gosh, I'm actually speaking to a new audience. Um, so then, you know, the conversation, now we are back to scratch again because now we have, we have, we have new talent on board. Um, so because of that whole dynamism, we are kind of stuck even for, for us uh, as creative lawyers at, at still empowering. So like for me, I have this section where I, I am always like doing trainings. And then on this side, I'm also juggling now the, the clients who are you know now aware of their IP. Um, so it, it's, it's almost a 50-50, but yes, I mean, I think even the, the younger generation have realized that they need it. Uh, the problem again with the younger generation is that how they have, how they have socialized themselves in terms of they see the quick wins, they will see the money, and then they'll realize the, the repercussions of, of the, the ill-informed contract they signed later, you know, after now all the money is gone and they're like, oh my gosh, now what next? And then, you know, it, it, it's, it's a messy affair. Um, I think also in my view, we, we need to have more lawyers understand and, and embrace mediation. Um, I mean, I have had the disadvantage in, in, in some instances where I, I dealt with, with fellow advocates and their, their tone, it was just, you know what, we're going to fight. Uh, you know, I've, I've had a mediation meeting canceled two hours too, you know, even after doing an email a few weeks before to prepare them and confirm what we would need for this initial meeting and asking them of the same and we're like, what do you need from, from us and our client? So that then we, we know what what's going on and, and then they say nothing and two hours to the meeting i think actually it was an hour to the meeting they say oh but maybe we can't do x y and z because we need your whole board to be present and they say how can i put five people together at once in an hour you know you had all this time to say something and then then you get there and they, they just you know, it just gets crazy. And, and some of them, I think it's because some of them have been very young lawyers. So in their minds, law is what they have seen in suits and, uh, you know, legal practice and whatnot. So <laughs> it I just was becomes say a that. mess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like there was one, I mean, it was just so painful that later I had to do an email to, to this young lawyer and just say, look, what you just did was disrespectful and it was not cool. Um, so I'm just hoping that you go, you think about what you've just done and, and see how you will remedy this situation. But what you did was not right. Um, yeah. so I think, I think lawyers need to, to really understand that. I think they've also not seen that mediation has money. Um, cause I can say me, I am comfortably around mediation. I don't, I don't do litigation. I mean, by the time we, we go to litigation with our clients, it's really the last resort. Um, and I'll get to that in a bit. But mediation, lawyers don't understand that you can earn from that and move on. Um, I have had the privilege to also do apprenticeship in the US, uh, in Las Vegas, which is very huge on entertainment. I've seen mediations being closed in a week. So then you realize why are Kenyan lawyers so adamant towards mediation? And yet here you mediate a situation, make your money, move on to the next brief. I don't know why they don't see, I don't know why they don't see that. So then you find that so many things tend, tend to, to, drag, to, drag, to drag for so long. Um, here in Kenya, I think one of the greatest challenges we have is mostly the corporates understanding the value of creativity, one, and two, the value of mediation. I have represented clients against corporates and even there was a contract, but then somehow in their minds, they feel like 
maybe because they are corporate, they can actually, you know, uh, go against a contract that they signed at the last minute and inconvenience a client, right? Uh, and because that has happened a lot, you'll find so many creatives lose hope in, in, in the legal system. So half the time they will say, you know what, I, I am just fed up. I invested so much emotionally, physically, financially on this. And then now, you know, the, I've, I've just not been, excuse my French, I've been shafted from, from my work. And, you know, I'm tired. I want to go and sleep, you know. So I've had clients even, I tell them, you know what, I'll do this for free. Please, let's just pursue. So because the more you, you acquiesce, they think it's fine. And then that means the next artist will suffer the same, the next and the next. Then you guys will right. have to start looking for mainstream jobs. You will be like, okay, now maybe I should just go and do accounts and become an accountant. Yep. And yet it's just because of also just that conduct that you have to find the fighting spirit. Um, yep. And then it's because of that frustration with the corporates. Um, so I think, I think when you're looking into this uh, mediation uh, strategy for the creative industry, uh, I, the greatest focus, in my view, would have to be the corporates because they are the greatest infringers. They are the most disrespectful in the ecosystem and trying to figure out what that would look like. We are still trying to push more of our, of our creatives to have associations, um, properly crafted associations with proper management because for them on their side, they, the weakness has been it's the artists who want to do the work themselves. You're not a lawyer, you're an artist, but you want to to play, the, to play the role of a lawyer. You're not a marketer, but you want to play the role of a marketer. You know, you're not a business person. You're not in business development, but you're trying to be a business developer in an association. Then again, issues of conflict of interest arise. And then they end up, you know, disagree with each other. Then there's bad blood and then boom, the association is, is dead. So we're still trying to, to, you know, try and educate them on that and, and share many examples. And hopefully they will see that because at the end of the day, even as, as lawyers in the ecosystem, there's only so much we can do. We give them the knowledge and then they figure out how to do that, to, to, what to do with the knowledge. You know, they say you can take the cow to the river, but you can't force them to drink. So it's, it's the same situation. So we are trying to, to do that. But I think in the meantime, it's figuring out the corporates. Um, I, I, I mean, I imagine that this is for purposes of, of learning, right? So it's a, it's a free space to speak. <laughs> so like in the music industry, we're looking at uh, people like Safari and Skiza, the greatest culprits in the music ecosystem when it comes to earning, when it comes to the rights of the artists to earn. Uh, I currently have several cases, you know, with, with either Safaricom or Skiza and, and the PRSPs in the middle, the premium rate service providers who uh, aggregate the content and, and it's, it's just one messy merry-go-round. And then even as a lawyer, you get tired because it becomes a conversation of, no, 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 you shouldn't be talking to us. Talk to, I don't know, Liberty or somebody. Then Liberty says, Aye, but it's not our platform, it's a party cop, you know? So by the time you're doing all these things, this merry-go-round, the client is tired. Um, and half of them, you know, trying to get uh, even the creatives to understand that we, that, let's just bite the bullet and go to court it takes a lot of convincing. So most of them, they're like, oh, but you know, if I go to court, no, no one will want to work with me. Uh, I'll be blacklisted. That is their greatest fear. So because of those fears, then they would rather just sit, take six months, take a six month hiatus, go through depression, see a counselor, go, go to shags. Like that's what they will do. And then they'll come back and maybe they're happy and they're like, okay, Sawa, let me do my next film. Let me do my next song. You know, <laughs> it's, it's the sort of thing. So I think it's, it's, a, it's more of a behavioral change that we need to work on and see how in terms of infrastructure and mediation, we, we, can, we can work on that. And I'd, I'd be happy to sort of be part of the team and see what we can do. But once we figure out the corporates, I think it will be so much easier. Because the creatives are happy when they hear, oh, mediation, to Tuskizana, we move on. They're happy to hear that. But half the time, because also some of these corporates do not have a reputation to uh, keep their word or bring themselves to the table, it just becomes very frustrating. And as Mike has said, you know, at the end of the day, this is their, this is their main hassle. So whatever they find, whatever they, they're offered, they will accept because they also are aware that if I don't take it, artist X will take the deal or actor X or film X, you know, the next person will take the deal. So let yeah. me just take that 200 shillings, even though I know my work is worth 100K, but at least 200K, I'm okay. That is the challenge. So I think, I think that is where we, 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 are, we are really at. It's, uh, it's the corporates. I think it's figuring out what kind of structure. We are in a very interesting 
space. Um, you know, when, when I look at some of the mediations I have done, there have been others that have been with, with either South African uh, companies, UK companies, um, and we've, we've resolved those issues very quick. I think, again, it comes back to also the lawyers because I think we have been stuck in that suits mentality that it's defend, defend, defend to the end, even though you know your client has done wrong, but you're not even sitting down telling your client, by the way, what is the truth? Um, did you actually, did your client, did you actually do this? If you did, yeah. this is wrong. This is wrong. So remedy this wrong, we take this out. Lawyers are not doing that. They're actually telling their clients, deny, 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 deny. Yeah, that time you have like a whole full folder of discovery and you're telling them, you know what, have you looked at your client's documents? Look at document X, look at document Y. At the end of the day, this is what has happened. Tell your client to just accept and help them save money. I know you want to earn money in litigation, but come on. <laughs> it will be also yeah. very embarrassing for you in court when we're, we are releasing some of these things and, and you look bad. So I think, I think it's, it's the lawyers. Uh, Kenyan lawyers don't have to eat humble pie. I've, I've, I've had mediations with some of the biggest firms in the UK and the US and, 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 and SA. And for a lawyer of 20, 30 years standing, actually just sending and saying, cancel. Uh, we have talked to our client and it's true, they have errored. So please give us some time. Uh, we are already in conversations. Uh, give us about a week or two weeks. We shall come up with a counter offer and blah, blah, blah. You know, if you have any issues, let us know. So even some of our mediations have been immediations. We've not met, you know, physically. So we've managed to do that. But I think it's because these lawyers have understood the value of, of also putting your client uh, in their rights and educating them and letting them know. So I think for us, it's the creatives. I think they are fine. It's these other people. It's, you know, we, we, we have not been asking ourselves as lawyers as well, why aren't they using lawyers? Um, and, and I think if, if, you, if you see some of my, my media interviews, I always have a parting shot. Stop, uh, you know, I'm trying to tell them, don't demonize all the lawyers. We, there are some of us who are honest, just come, knock the door. We, 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 we are flexible, right? But it's for the longest time, they were like, I lawyers, Apana, you know? It's, it's a situation. And then, you know, because again, so many of the mediators, we are, we are also lawyers. So again, you know, it's, it's just a whole situation. Um, so it's, it's figuring out that ecosystem. I think also in terms of, we have to figure out how also to package a mediator because sometimes from what I've seen with, with creatives, um, they sort of tend not to relate well with their peers, right? Because, um, I'll give an example of a certain record label a couple of years I worked with. The CEO was also a, an artist managing other artists. So of course you can see that conflict of interest. So CEO is busy shining, she's releasing songs, but the guys under the record label are not, you know. And then at the same time, uh, you know, the owner of the label is saying, no, 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 we talk to the CEO, we resolve this matter. And they're like, of course not. I'm not going to talk to this person because we're already competing. Right. So again, figuring out <laughs> who needs how a mediator would look like for the creative industry and and how do they champion. So I, I foresee also a lot of marketing around it because artists relate to products. They relate to something that is packaged that speaks to their needs. In the absence of that, you know, again, they might not see the the need for it. Yeah. So I think I think that would be my, my take in summary in terms of some of the observations I have made. Thank you. Awesome, Liz. Thank you so much. Thank you for validating my point on corporates. I'm, I'm happy I'm not the lone voice. <laughs> and, and you know, mine was just perception. Yours is actually actually experience. So it, it, it really yeah. validates. And I guess my question back to, to this group, and thank you so much, Sarah and Mangari, for hosting us. Um, what is your group doing in terms of, it's interesting to hear from, from Liz, who does both, um, both legal and mediation. Um, it was, I'm just wondering, what what is your organization doing in terms of growing the culture of mediation with with corporates? Because uh, I'm hearing from Liz that we still have a while to go with that as well. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, we'll come to that when we go through the thrive uh, okay, in cool. just a, a little bit. Uh, okay. But I just 
like to connect uh, what Liz has talked about with uh, what uh, Emily okay, will come on and uh, talk about. Uh, Emily mentioned in the comments something about partnership uh, between mediators and creatives. And I'll just give an opportunity for Emily to be able to uh, you know, share her comments and questions as well. And then we'll be able to come back to you know, what, what is Vasiliana Hub doing in terms of engaging the, the corporates. Uh, Emily? Um, thank you very much for the ongoing discussion. Uh, it's very enlightening. And um, yeah, I was just bringing out an issue, um, or rather I was just commenting on how it would be good to see a, a partnership uh, formulated between the creatives and the mediator, the mediator group, which is already, uh, I would say, on board, as the creatives have various issues um so instead of the usual going to court or yeah the harshness that is brought out in resolving uh, issues it would be good to see the mediators coming and resolving these things and uh, the creatives getting what is their worth in um in what they're creating day by day yeah thank you okay um, yes, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Emily, for that. Uh, I'll just invite uh, William to be able to make uh, his comment before I come back to you, Mike, for your final comments. Absolutely. Uh, William? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. Thanks, uh, uh, Mike. Uh, wow. Uh, Liz has actually <laughs> said it all, uh, and of course, I I join issues with her. But perhaps I could just maybe just add, or rather, emphasize and re-emphasize that uh, you know, coming from what Mike has advised creatives, and that is it. It starts with getting the right team around you. That's crucial. It's not rocket science. If you look at creatives that have made it, they're creatives that have a team. And uh, this team, of course, would comprise of some of us, uh, intellectual property lawyers, and as such, relationships that are contractual must be those that can be easily interpreted through well-drafted agreements, well-drafted agreements. And I'm sure that uh, my colleagues here will agree that it's not all lawyers or advocates that can draft intellectual property agreements. These agreements must be drafted by either intellectual property lawyers or lawyers who understand intellectual property. And they must bring out very clearly what the terms are. They must define very clearly what the rights are. And in most cases, the mistakes that we make as lawyers is that we think that we are the lawyers and as such, we come up with what we think is correct for the creatives or for the contractual arrangement among the creatives. My take here is listen to the creatives because this is their business. With us, we are lawyers out here. Go to the creatives, understand what they do, understand the relationships that they intend to create, understand the relationships that they intend to enter into. And based on that, guide that conversation and bring in, chip in, and bring out the language that will bring out that relationship perfectly. Because if you don't do that, then you yourself as the purported drafter becomes a problem. 
and you become someone who has added to a possible conflict. Because another colleague will interpret or will actually misinterpret what you thought were good intentions. And coming to dispute resolution, it's also important perhaps to have a tiered one, and I agree with Liz here. Because in the absence of such, unfortunately, intellectual property, if you do not indicate or include a dispute resolution that is tiered, tiered meaning that you provide for a possibility of starting from negotiation and where negotiation fails, you then try mediation or whatever it is and it goes on and on up to a possibility of arbitration. Of course, I know that uh, Liz mentioned this, but I just wanted to re-emphasize that tiered, that tiered uh, dispute resolution clause really works out perfectly. It really works out perfect. Also, to remember that once you have a tiered dispute resolution clause that ends with arbitration, you will automatically have locked out the courts completely. And that would always work better for the creatives. Remember, just like any other industry, just like any business, businesses thrive on relationships. And as Mike had indicated earlier, once you find yourselves in courts, those relationships will possibly be constrained and they will not continue after the decision or after the judgment, which God knows when. Could be five years, could be 10 years, could be 15 years. I have a file here and I agree with Liz where one of those big corporates, Liz is brave enough to mention some of them. I actually have gone through that agreement and that agreement has an arbitration clause. And you ask yourself and you reach out to your, to your, to, to your colleagues, why are we in court? And I think one of the, the weak link is also the judiciary itself because we have magistrates and judges that are not so learned about this industry and about intellectual property. You try and make an application, a preliminary objection, which is automatic. The moment there is an arbitration clause, that particular case should have got no business in court. And we still have the matter here going. And that brings out the arrogance that uh, Liz is uh, talking about. And let me say, I have, not on one occasion, personally received calls from some of the top CEOs around. Intimidation, a lot of intimidation from the corporate world. And if you thought that <laughs> that was, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to say that it's better to be intimidated by the corporate world, but I have also been, I don't know about my colleagues here, I've also been intimidated by my own colleagues who come from the so-called big farms. And when you look at their profile, you will realize that they have got no clue whatsoever about what IP and the creative industry is all about. So we, we also get intimidated by our own colleagues. And for me, that I call ignorance and arrogance that does not lead anywhere. And yes, so that my colleagues, just to, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to add you on, as long as you know your, your, as long as you know your subject, as long as you know your work, your negotiation skill will be enriched. And it doesn't matter, including those intimidating CEOs, 
I have engaged them from the very beginning. From the very beginning. One of these mobile, uh, you know, uh, one of these big uh, mobile industries in this country just wanted to sit on millions and millions of shillings belonging to some young, innocent, naive creatives. Okay? And in as much as I dared to take them to court, I actually invited them for a possible negotiation and it worked out very well. Very, very well. So, yes, it's important to, you know, just uh, know the subject matter, know it well, be informed. I have learned so much myself from, uh, from Mike on the industry today. A lot, a lot has come from, I mean, a lot has come from, a lot of what I know has actually come from uh, the clients, from the creatives, and they come in all manner of ways. So, yes, at the end of the day, the court will still be the big brother. And perhaps to just complete by answering, answering Mike, uh, who had initially asked about the IP infringement. Yes, the, the courts will usually have the first jurisdiction, but that is only if the dispute resolution clause does not lock them out. And how do you lock them out? Once again, I repeat, just lock them out completely. Because it's a contract at the end of the day, it's a private contract. Lock them out completely by indicating that the parties have agreed to mediate or to arbitrate. And in that way, it doesn't matter whether it is an infringement. Of course, unless it also has certain criminal elements, and in particular in the copyright world. But as long as it is civil, the best thing is just to lock them out. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, William and uh, Liz and uh, Emily for your contribution, most appreciated. Uh, I'll come back to you, Mike, uh, for your final comments before um, I, I hand you over to Bangari for a few more questions. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I mean, mine is to just say uh, thank you, guys. This has been, um, you know, I've always wondered about mediation, so I've, I've known about it generally, uh, not, not specifically. Um, so it's, uh, it's good to see that it's a growing um, side uh, to, the, to the industry and I think it would fit very well. So I'd like to, to thank uh, uh, the organization for ha hosting us. Thank you, Wangari, for reaching out, for you, Sarah, for the questions, uh, for William and, and for Muhammad as well. Um, I want to do a quick shout out to Nakuru. Uh, James is on the call. He works with the county government down there, uh, and works with the creative industry. If there's any mediators in Nakuru, um, get in touch with him. I think he can post his contacts in the, in the group as well. Um, and Nakuru are doing great things. It has, a, it has an enabling. I think Nakuru and Machakwas are two very good examples of what can happen with the creative industry in the, in the counties where you have um, a good uh, uh, an enabling governor and government in, in, in place. Um, we hope it continues. Um, but yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Also, I learned a lot, guys. Um, and uh, feel free to share my, my email, uh, Sarah, with, uh, with, I'm sure you have a mailing group or something, a WhatsApp group, feel free to share that. I'm happy to engage further if anyone needs some direction. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll just have uh, Wangari well, come on. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. And um, I really would like to thank you, Mike, for the, this discussion. 
um, our first interaction was uh, with regards to the being a music producer. So for those who do not know, they should know that Mike has trained me as a music producer, or <laughs> I should say probably like as himself, as an applied music producer, perhaps. Yes, applied music producer, <laughs> yes, yeah. I think, yeah. I think, and, and really when we were um, having the, 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 the courses um, on um, um, being a music producer, it really occurred to me um, that um, in South Africa, this is actually very, it, it's a profession. You have people yeah. who actually wake up every day and they are officially music producers. You don't just take music and put it inside a movie and yes. uh, right now I'm in, in reflections when you have like TikTok and you know at the back of it I mean it's, 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 an, it's an exciting uh, TikTok uh, to follow or to listen to and there's yeah. you know some, some local music so I would now having gone through that I'm very awakened to okay yeah so does it mean that very soon we'll now be having our uh, very new creatives, as um, Liz Langer has even said, the new generation creatives, because the new generation creatives is even you and I. Is, I mean, yeah. are those uh, probably the suits that will be coming up very soon? Because uh, people have just created and picked, you know, I've, I've picked uh, a song done by Emily Okeo and put it in my uh, very creative uh, TikTok or any other um, avenue and they're on YouTube or any of the other platforms. So yeah. I think. Um, and uh, probably just highlighting um, on, on, on Wasilian Hub. Wasilian Hub, these are conversations that we are having um, around um, a number of sectors. And um, also we have the great opportunity to have them being broadcast through the um, American uh, Spaces Kenya and uh, through the American uh, Kona Moi uh, through their channels so that we can increase the awareness of the profession that is known as mediation. You asked legitimately, so I mean, is mediation known? I mean, what is mediation doing um, for this particular sector? And um, I must say that um, as, as the peers who are mediators, we are causing our voices to get to be known more and more, and especially with what you're calling the executives, executives such as yourself. Yeah. And uh, that is the uh, rationale of um, even inviting someone like you to help us to understand the sector you work in, what are the decisions you have to make, who is involved, and with that then we are able to know where are possible areas of clashing, uh, and then how can mediation uh, be able to uh, be used, uh, uh, or if mediation is not able to be used, I mean probably what are other avenues that um, could, um, could be there. And with that then, Mike, I have a couple of questions to you, uh, specifically as a business executive which are aimed to help us as mediators just to understand, you know, what's the psyche of a business executive? How do they think? What is their motivation? Um, what are the things that concern them? And if those things that concern them, perhaps we as mediators in how we uh, prepare, our, prepare ourselves or prepare our work, then we are able to uh, serve you much better as a, as, as a business executive. And, um, this is what we refer to as the as Thrive uh, Commercial Dispute uh, Resolution for uh, the, uh, the Wasiliana Hub team. And uh, Thrive Dispute Resolution is a service that we have developed to be able to serve uh, people who, as I've said earlier, are CEOs and CFOs of organizations and also for value-driven boards. So the questions that I'll be going with you are just to help to understand yet again in terms of you know what drives you uh, what are your concerns and what are uh, the key metrics that you as the uh, uh, as a business executive um, as we take like right now you are the ceo you are founder what are the things that uh, drive you so mike firstly i'd like to understand yes what motivates you as a person so yes what motivates you making a difference making an impact okay. leaving a legacy yeah okay okay leaving a legacy Okay, wonderful. So then now let's uh, now come back now to your, to your work. And so this, we, we refer to it as our executive high five. Um, so as an executive uh, for a business organization, the organization has to balance between risk, rewards, and uh, returns. And these, they vary based on the nature of the organization and also its leadership. So specifically for you, what returns, and this could be on e as impact, value, or profit, are you pegged on? And for what rewards and by who? What returns, for what rewards, and by who? Mike? Um, I mean, I think my business philosophy is the double bottom line. So 
it's profit and people. Um, you know, you can't, it's unsustainable to be profit driven all the time. And I think history has shown that. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it in terms of, um, there was a question around risk. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, what's, the, what's the impact? What's the uh, returns? And then what's the, yeah, the risk? Yeah, I'm, I'm generally a high risk person. Um, um, so, and, and always have been for some, well, I grew up on a farm and that's my future. So I guess I have a safety net. Um, so I guess that's why I've taken a lot of, uh, high risk, uh, um, decisions in my, in my life, including being an entrepreneur, um, and starting a business in, in a foreign country, uh, which obviously comes with a lot of risks. Um, so, and then in terms of rewards, I think, I think my, my philosophy again is, is build it and they will come, um, you know, make, just do the right thing, um, do what feels right, do what needs to be done. Um, what's important for me personally is justice, um, but justice in the, justice in the context of intellectual property. I think there's a lot of injustice. We've discussed it a lot today. Um, there's a lot of, there has been a lot of injustice. There continues to be a lot of injustice. At the moment, uh, my, both myself, um, David Cate and Liz Lanjo are, are part of a group uh, uh, consulting on the free trade agreements with the USA. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to be surrounded with professionals like them and there are others in the group as well and, and, getting, and getting their insights. And the government reached out to us for, for input from, from the private industry, which, which is also good. It, you know, it, it validates us, um, you know, the three of us and the others in the group as private industry that we really are um, doing something right and making a difference and, and leading the conversation. Uh, to be asked the input and you know our concern uh, let me not speak for my colleagues but my my personal concern is generally the US is very exploitive um, in their approach and very exploitive and very aggressive in their approach to intellectual property in their approach to protect it when it belongs to theirs but then in their approach to to acquire it at very uh, inequitable terms um, when they are licensing. Not the case in every case, um, but definitely in, in enough cases that I have seen to raise some concerns. So um, I think the, the rewards are, are there, but the rewards need to be, it needs, it's more than just money. It's, it's more about equitable rewards, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for that. So number yeah. three, what risks keep you up at night concerned and you worried about them me taking on too much <laughs> okay yes the risk the risk the the risk of deadlines okay yes okay the risk of deadlines okay yes. then um uh, in the interaction between people and resources and ideas within organizations we do have uh conflicts um that arise so yeah. based on how they are prepared for the mitigation measures that are taken and other factors, a full-blown dispute may arise. So number four, what has been your most difficult dispute? And please tell us a bit more about it, how, is it, man how it was managed and the outcomes. Thank you. Um, apart from the one I'm currently in, uh, which I can't talk about, um, I would say, so um, for those who got my profile in, a, in advance, and, and thank you, Wangari and for Sarah for sending it out. Um, I served on the board for the Music Publishers Association of Kenya. I still serve on the board. Uh, and Pake was set up as an associate, as just that. It was set up as an association to represent the interests of music publishers. For those who don't know, music publishers represent the rights of uh, songwriters and composers. We do all the boring administration work that, that those guys usually don't want to do. Um, and we find them more opportunities to, to monetize uh, their work uh, through intellectual property. 
So I joined it. I joined um, to, as a as a producer as an association. Um, at the same time, uh, this is public knowledge, so I will I will just mention names. Uh, at the same time, the regulator being Kokobo invited us to change our memorandum of articles and to then apply for a license to be a collective management organization for copyright. The license was at that time held by the Music Copyright Society of Kenya, who had, had been given some warnings by the regulator, uh, several warnings, um, because of uh, allegations of mismanagement, corruption, and what have you. Um, and as a CMO, you need to submit your financial returns uh, on renewal of your license. So they didn't meet the criteria in the previous year. They re were reluctantly given a license because there was no one else. And Pake was asked to apply the following year. We did, and we won on merit. Uh, our approach was going to be to transform the industry digitally, which we did. In fact, all the digital uh, initiatives you're seeing now by Kokobo were all our ideas, and I doubt Kokobo would tell you any different. Um, we actually have our, our application documents available if anyone wants to see them, but the ideas came from us, and it was a team. I, I by no means did I lead it. I'm not the technical person. We had great minds like Bernard Kyoko, who is still our chairman. Uh, incidentally, the the clause in the, the anti-piracy clause for ISPs in the Copyright Act was actually the work of Bernard Kiyoko. He actually sued Safaricom a few years ago, and that was the precursor for, for this law. Um, he was uh, assisted by uh, Moriasi of Du Sauti Sol's lawyer. I think Kate was also involved in that suit as well. Um, and then Dan Asada, who's also a muse musician, but very few people know he's also an ICT expert. Um, so we had a great strategy. We won, we got the license, we were kept from doing our job by court and a lot of corruption for, in 2017 for the first 11 months. We were only able to collect for one month um, uh, when we finally won the case. Um, then in 2018, we were frustrated further when we were, um, part of our license was to jointly collect with Kenya Association of Music Producers and Performance Rights Society of Kenya. So we were forced into a marriage uh, by the regulator and that marriage didn't work out. Um, there were a lot of different agendas. Um, and I guess my challenge to, to mediators and the mediation industry, the CMOs are a whole other story. And the challenge is, is that they are governed by boards uh, the, those boards can have up to, I think, the, I think the regulations have now capped them at nine members. They used to be 12. You can imagine three CMOs sitting in a room to make decisions and you could have up to 27 people in one room and you only need one person to disagree and it derails the whole process. We used to, I, my life was on hold in 2017 and 2018. Um, it was a very challenging time in my life. I am not exaggerating when I would say that some of these meetings would run, a meeting that was scheduled to run two hours would run six, eight, 12 hours. We would sometimes be leaving meetings after midnight. We would have a meeting and because there was so much mistrust, the minutes would be done. I was personally accused for doctoring minutes. Um, and I hate doing minutes and they refused to hire a company secretary um, 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 for whatever reason. Then I had to do the minutes. I did them. Then I was accused of doctoring the minutes. So the next meeting, we were told uh, that we all do the minutes in the meeting. They are typed. Everyone signs before they leave the meeting. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Minutes were done and signed, and then uh, the next day after the meeting, when the scans of the minutes went out, um, uh, different parties uh, um, disowned the minutes. You know, so uh, while as much as we would want to mediate under such circumstances, and I believe that we tried, uh, I don't believe we ever engaged an official mediator. So that's maybe something that could could have been tried.
right? But I also believe that, uh, as as uh, Liz said when she uh, she jumped in um, uh, later, that you know all parties need to agree to mediation. Um, I believe when you have a situation where where different number one, first there's so many individuals and so many agendas involved, and number two, where some of those people don't want to see a positive outcome to mediation. They actually want to see this relationship derailed. It's very difficult. So I would say that in terms of a dispute resolution, that one was a fail. Um, we did go to court. Um, I don't think the issue has been fully resolved to date, to be honest. And Parque lost out, lost its license. It lost a lot of money, which was personal money that uh, we as directors invested. Um, and there are, still, uh, there are still bills that are unpaid because uh, other parties still owe us money and they know they do. So that's why I don't have an issue mentioning it here. Um, so I guess, I guess it's probably an unresolved uh, dispute. So, so maybe we'll be engaging in future to, to see if we can give mediation a, a try. Okay. Okay, thank you for uh, that response. And I think it probably uh, really ties into uh, what you're moving into next. So mediation is a form of dispute resolution that's available to organizations that enables yeah. the disputing parties with the help of a third party neutral to come up with sustainable, a sustainable way forward that is efficient in terms of time, money, public image, and helps to keep the business relationships. As a business leader, have you been part of a commercial mediation process? that is with an external third party neutral? Um, and is this a mechanism that you would consider uh, for your organization or now for yourself? Uh, there are several organizations which you are part of. I think you alluded to part of this. Thank you. Yes, Mike? Yes, I mean, I think, and I like the way it's been framed as well and, and defined, you know, you've really helped me uh, and please send me this slide later uh, about the definition of uh, mediation. What I'm liking in your definition is around you know time. We tried to do it ourselves. We wasted so much time, um, money. So much money was spent. I mean, time is money. Uh, for me, every 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 hour I spent in those meetings was time away from my business and lost money. I actually, in those two years, I actually lost some time. Um, and that's and that's that's not an immediate loss. That's a long term loss because to get clients back, it's a lot easier to keep the customers you have than to get new business, right? Um, public image is important. You know, we were, we, there was a lot of, um, uh, what can I say? A lot of attacks from both sides. You know, uh, you, you get attacked, you attack back, you know, it's just not healthy. And I think what I've come to learn, it's, it's now two years later and I'm still engaging with the same people, but under different terms, you know, um, and what I've come to learn over the years is how you find people is, is not where you find them in future. You know, I, I'll meet you here, but I'll meet you in a different organization somewhere else. And and what is, what has uh, my my business has been a a B two B business in terms of the event industry. But now with uh, my that was fat. But now as my movies Africa, we're now B two C. Every person I engage with is a potential customer. So that engagement needs to be positive at at all levels. You know, even if we don't agree. Uh, let us let us just agree to disagree, but we are at still civil and still remember that we're all people at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, those are uh, inquiries that we are making with uh, any of the business executives that we are bringing into our discussions, just to understand oh. what are their concerns and also just to get what's the understanding of mediation and also their experiences um, around it. So Thrive, yeah. Com yeah, Thrive Commercial Dispute Resolution is um, a strategy that we, ha we, we have developed to be able to uh, uh, now approach, as we approach uh, chief executive officers and also uh, the finance uh, people here taking that, uh, these are the two business leaders who actually, who actually deal with the money side of the business. And yeah. uh, there's actually been a comment at uh, one of our sessions that uh, if it was truly uh, computed in terms of how much money organizations are paying out due to disputes, many CEOs would be shown the door out. 
So we really would like to keep the CEOs uh, within the organizations because we know they have the technical and also they have the capacity to, uh, to build uh, the organizations into uh, big and better organizations, just that disputes could be in between um, them being able to serve their customers better. And also at the same time, even the big profits, uh, some of them which you've um, talked about. So Mike, yeah. I'd like to thank you for um, being with us in this discussion, as I uh, also thank uh, Emily Okeo of the American Konamoi and American Spaces for um, uh, broadcasting the, this conversation. The recording will be made available so it can be uh, listened into by other colleagues. Uh, the mediator William Agan, who has been on the call and uh, uh, added his uh, comments as an uh, IP lawyer, we would like to thank you for that. Uh, Liz Lenger, it's always a delight to be able to interact with yourselves in the, these uh, conversations. Uh, young mediator Mohammed Said, who uh, introduced the conversation to us. We normally have these conversations also including our young mediators uh, because we are clear that this is actually a profession that they can be able to develop. And we hope that they, as they get to understand the various sectors, they actually can develop their work um, um, aligned to the different sectors that are there. So with that, kindly allow me to send the conversation back to Mediator Sarah Ter, as I also say thank you very much, Mediator Sarah Ter, for joining us through today. And uh, we are looking forward to our next conversations. We will be having subsequent conversations um, uh, with, in the area of intellectual property. And uh, that is um, in the week of, um, on August 27th and uh, on uh, September 3rd, we will be having a mediator and IP lawyer William Agan taking us through the intellectual property in two sessions. And so colleagues, when you receive the uh, post up, feel free to share it. Um, as you said, creatives need to be able to understand um, this particular work. But also we are having this very in-depth discussion as mediators so that if we have mediators who wish or choose to even specialize in this area, then they have uh, greater and better understandings. So back to you, Mediator Sarah Ter, and thank you for moderating us. God bless you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, everybody. I think it has been a very uh, good, uh, insightful, fruitful afternoon, uh, learning about the creative sector and the opportunities available in the creative sector for uh, mediators. Uh, we shall close uh, right away uh, by uh, being able to recite the words of the anthem. Uh, we shall be able to recite the words of the national anthem in Kiswahili, and then uh, that shall be it. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukai na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha, to part in our story. Thank you very much, mediators, and uh, a good uh, evening to everybody. Thank you, everyone. Well done. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your questions. Bye bye.